Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Kenneth Gibson. In establishing a West of Scotland specialist unit for the treatment of endometriosis. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Thank you. We are working closely with Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board to help establish the West of Scotland Specialist Centre, which is expected to open in April 2019. Once open, the Glasgow Centre will be the third in Scotland with two specialist centres in Edinburgh and Aberdeen. The specialist centres, as I'm sure Mr Gibson knows, provide multidisciplinary, state-of-the-art, high-quality and person-centred treatment for the management of all grades of endometriosis and have an important role in raising awareness. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I'm pleased at the progress made since I raised this issue in my members' debate last year. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, one in ten Scottish women of childbearing age, some 150,000, live with endometriosis, the biggest cause of female infertility in Scotland. Given these numbers, what steps have been taken to provide information about endometriosis targeted particularly at young women to develop more specialist centres and when can we expect to see one in Ayrshire? Minister. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Gibson for the supplementary and uh, want to thank him for the significant efforts that he's made to raise the profile of endometriosis, including his motion in February of last year. Um, in terms of uh, information, I have asked officials to work with our uh, clinicians in this area. He's absolutely right in terms of uh, providing additional information and awareness, particularly amongst young women and girls, uh, in order to uh, increase the opportunities to provide the kind of care and treatment that is necessary. As he knows, this can be uh, a condition that only emerges uh, later on in life, and as a consequence of that, uh, can be much more difficult to treat. In terms of specialist centres, um, the clinical advice is that in the population of Scotland size, with the level of prevalence that Mr Gibson has quoted, then three specialist centres is what is recommended for the optimal approach to effective treatment of women in Scotland. However, that is where we are treating severe endometriosis endometriosis uh, and there is work going on to look at what else can be done that supports the uh, pathway into those centres and is able to uh, deal with uh, women and girls much earlier in their condition. Thank you. Question number two, Andy Whiteman. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to a recent report by the City of Edinburgh Council that requested licensing powers under the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 to allow local authorities to licence the use of domestic property for short-term letting. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I understand the pressure in some parts of the country for new controls over short-term letting of residential properties, uh, and we want to address that. Uh, and that is why in our programme for government, uh, we have committed to working with local government, communities and business interests to ensure that local authorities have appropriate regulatory powers. This will ensure local authorities can take decisions that balance the needs and concerns of their communities with wider economic and tourism interests. These powers will allow local authorities to protect the interests of local communities whilst providing a safe quality experience for visitors. Licensing may or may not be a part of the solution. The solution must be based on the best possible evidence we have already established a short-term lets delivery group of officials from across government to examine the issues around short-term letting. That group will consider the existing powers local authorities have and gather evidence as to whether further measures are required. The government is concerned about the potential negative impact of short-term lets on communities, which is why we are prepared to legislate if that is what, if that is, what is needed. Andy White. I thank the Minister for his answer and welcome the programme for government announcement and I'm glad we're beyond sandboxes and data observatories. But the specific request from Edinburgh was for powers under section 44 of the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. So first of all, will he bring forward a statutory instrument to provide those powers and if so, when? Second, can he confirm that such powers will be available to all local authorities? And third, can he confirm that such powers will be framed in broad terms to allow each local authority to develop their own licensing scheme or indeed no licensing scheme as they see fit in relationship to their own local needs? Minister. Um, President Officer, um, we acknowledge the concerns that uh, have been expressed by the City of Edinburgh Council. 
uh, and we welcome their contribution to the thinking around how best to manage short-term lets in their paper published on the 1st of August. Um, government officials uh, meet with Edinburgh City Council on a, a regular basis uh, and we'll be considering the council's proposals carefully. Uh, we'll work with them and other councils uh, who may have different views and with stakeholders to ensure the right balance is struck between adequate accommodation for visitors and, of course, ensuring permanent housing stock. Kezia Dugdale. President Officer, can I urge the uh, Minister to act as quickly as he possibly can? I've been inundated with complaints by people living in the city following the Edinburgh Festival and the problems they've had with Airbnb accommodation. If he's not prepared to act promptly, will he at least work with the sector to introduce a voluntary code to limit the number of days that properties can be rented out for short-term lets over the next 12 months if legislation is going to take longer than that? Um, President Officer, I, I understand that uh, Ms Dugdale and many folk want us to act quickly. Um, what I would say is that we've got to act appropriately and get this absolutely right. Uh, and that is why we have set up the group to examine all that is going on in this area. And we will take, um, we will take the views of communities, local authorities and stakeholders very, very seriously. I know that... Uh, Everyone in this place wants to get this right. We have to find the right balance. Uh, we will do so. Uh, I'm not going to talk about speed uh, because I don't think that that's necessarily uh, the way forward. It is about getting this absolutely right for all local authorities, for all communities and for stakeholders. Question number three, Mark Russell. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle overcrowding on rail services between Edinburgh and Dublin. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the member will be pleased to note that the final phase of electrification of the full route between Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dunblane is due to be completed later this year. Uh, to support this major infrastructure investment, around uh, £370 million of, pounds of Scottish Government funding is being provided to deliver a new fleet of 70 new Hitachi Class 385 trains which Abelio ScotRail will lease during this franchise term. The plan is for ScotRail to introduce greater capacity on Dunblane, uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow services from December 2018, with further increases in May 2019. However, this time frame is very much dependent on completion of Network Rail's electrification works and how ScotRail and Hitachi introduce introduction of the new C385 trains uh, proceeds. Uh, my officials at Transport Scotland are working closely with those organisations to maximise the success of these transformational investments. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed response and indeed welcome him uh, to his new role. I'm sure that in discussions with his own constituents he'll recognise that the capacity issue is a big one and that effectively these services are standing room only at peak times. They're dangerously overcrowded. So can you assure me that as the 385 trains get rolled out, that the Edinburgh Dunblane service will not be stuck with a short four-carriage 365 trains, because an overcrowded train is still an overcrowded train, regardless of whether it's electrified or not? Minister. So, President Officer, I do recognise the concerns which the member is raising, and as I said out in my earlier response, as of December this year, ScotRail do intend to have uh, greater carriage numbers uh, available on the Edinburgh Dunblane service. Uh, that will give an increase in capacity, but it is dependent upon the electrification works being uh, completed on time, which I know uh, Network, Network Rail and uh, ScotRail uh, are working very closely uh, uh, together on to make sure that this work is completed on time. Uh, but overall, uh, once the new Hitachi trains uh, are rolled out uh, into service, that will provide even further capacity on services right across Scotland, including uh, on the Edinburgh to Dunblane line. And Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Users of the service talk about crush hour, not rush hour. There are a shortage of carriages, there is a practice of uh, skip stopping and early termination of services. Uh, the previous Transport Minister said that ScotRail would get a grip of this, but given that uh, ScotRail's PPMs are at a three year low at the moment, what assurances can the current Transport Secretary make uh, to users of the Dunblane service when they will see some tangible results and improvements on this line? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, Senior Officer, I've just outlined uh, in my earlier answers the improvements that are taking place just now, and that includes the very significant capital investment into electrification of this particular line, along with the uh, rest of the electrification that's taking place within the central belt, and that there will be additional capacity provided in December of this year on this particular line um, once the electrification work is completed. And that will continue to be rolled out as the new Hitachi trains uh, come on stream as well. Question number four, Mike Rumbles. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government, in light of information provided by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre that NHS Grampian has received the lowest share of public funding of any NHS board for each of the last nine years, how the new Health Secretary plans to reimburse NHS Grampian for a funding shortfall totalling £165.6 million over that period? Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. In this year, 1819, NHS Grampian received a resource uplift of 2.1%, the highest percentage uplift of any territorial board, taking their annual resource budget to £921 million. The NHS resource allocation formula, NRAC, sets out target shares for the distribution of funding to the 14 territorial boards. The formula was introduced in 2009-10 in order to provide improvements in predicting relative needs across board areas. The approach taken by the Scottish Government has been to move boards towards parity gradually over a number of years, and in 2018-19 all boards have been brought to within 0.8% of parity. Mike Rumbles. Well, it's very welcome to moving towards parity, but NHS Grampian still has consistently the worst waiting times the worst for chronic pain, the worst for cancer, the third worst for child and adolescent mental health, staff numbers dropping in almost every field, the tripling of vacant hospital positions. This is due to the funding formula. Will the Health Secretary make the case with her Cabinet colleagues to find at least some of the £165 million of underfunding from her own funding formula to address this crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me make a number of points. First of all, as I'm sure Mr Rumbles knows, because he's been round this particular course many a time before, the funding formula is not my funding formula. It is set by an independent uh, group of uh, experts, including uh, board representatives, uh, health, academics, and so on. Secondly, it is not possible, as Mr Rumbles seeks to do, to make a causal connection between challenges that boards may have in recruiting staff or in meeting the right targets that we have set for them in terms of patient care and the funding formula. The way in which you move towards parity is precisely what we as a government have done and that is to take it step by step because otherwise the consequence of what Mr Rumbles is suggesting is that boards in other parts of the country, equally challenged, equally trying to provide high quality health care, equally expected by me to meet those targets, will be stripped of funds. And that strikes me as a deeply unfair, irresponsible and disproportionate way to proceed. So we will proceed to deliver, as Ms Robinson said before me, in that stepped way towards parity as we have done, and I'm very pleased that we are now 0.8% closer to parity across all our boards, an approach we'll continue to take. Question number five, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the completion status and final outturn costs of the William McIlvanny School Campus in Kilmarnock. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Officer, in October last year, I laid the foundation stone for the £45.3 million William McIlvanny campus. I look forward to visiting the campus, which opened in April later this month, to see the modern state-of-the-art educational facilities that are available to the children and young people of Kilmarnock. Willie Coffey. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As we formally open this magnificent new campus next week and welcome all the staff and pupils and even those who voted against the budget that built the school, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that there will be no 30-year legacy of public debt with this campus as there is under previous school building schemes brought in by Labour. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the William McIlvanny campus represents a very significant investment in the educational facilities of children and young people in uh, Kilmarnock. It has been the product of very good joint working by East Ayrshire Council and by the Scottish Government working together. It's part of 
a very ambitious schools building programme which has seen the number of uh, children and young people educated in good or satisfactory buildings across Scotland increase from 61% in 2007 when this government came to office to 86% at the present time, representing a transformation of the educational estate for young people in Scotland and a significant element of cooperation between the government and local authorities. Question number six, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to investigate the financing of the Calmac vessel MV Loch Seaforth, which is now owned by Lloyds Banking Group after a lease deal was agreed at a reported cost to the public purse of £53 million. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. A full tender process for a lease arrangement was undertaken by Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited in line with the EU procurement rules. This resulted in the award of the contract to Lloyds Banking Group as their tender was assessed as the most economically advantageous. Audit Scotland published the report Transport Scotland's Ferry Services to Parliament in October 2017. This included comment on the MV Log Seaforth uh, procurement, but Audit Scotland, having concluded their analysis of this and other procurement decisions, did not raise anything of concern regarding the procurement of the MV Log Seaforth. There are therefore no plans on the part of the Scottish Government to investigate the financing of the MV Log Seaforth. Rhoda Grant. That, that is truly disappointing and what is shocking is that this boat will require to be handed back as new in 2022 or a new lease negotiated. The two ferries that have been further delayed um, and it's not clear when they will come to, into service if ever and those um, revelations follow a summer of chaos in the Western Isles and Argyll that's still ongoing because of inadequate ferries and no capacity in the fleet to deal with breakdowns. This is costing the island's economies dear and the government have simply turned a blind eye. Instead of taking money from Carmack, will he now invest, invest in a new ferry? Minister. <clears throat> well, it's disappointing uh, to hear from Rhoda Grant uh, a lack of recognition of the £1 billion that's been invested by this government in the High Clyde and Hebrides ferry services since 2007. I acknowledge, I acknowledge that there's great concern in the islands about ensuring resilience in the ferry services. I fully acknowledge that and happy to uh, uh, engage in that issue with, with members across the chamber. But it would, I would hope that uh, Rhoda Grant, in, in framing her question, might recognise that we are commissioning new ferries from Ferguson Marine Eng Engineering Limited, that uh, a revised delivery programme has been discussed by uh, FML and CMAL, and Parliament were informed of the date on 16th of October, August 2018 and uh, in recognition of the importance of this as I say the government has invested not just in ferries but also in harbour facilities uh, across the routes mm -hmm. in the area and we continue to invest in ferry services and I would hope that Rhoda Grant would acknowledge that. Mm. Alistair Allen. <coughs> the Minister will be aware that the need for additional capacity is the most pressing ferry related issue. Uh, will he commit to uh, visiting my constituency to meet with myself and other stakeholders at the summit to discuss this important issue. Minister. Uh, I was very pleased indeed to visit uh, Dr Allen's constituency last month and to meet the uh, Carla and, and local stakeholders to discuss issues including ferry services. I'd be very pleased to visit Dr Allen's beautiful constituency once again uh, to meet with his uh, stakeholders and again discuss ferry services and other connectivity issues which I appreciate are very important uh, to the islands. I do agree that capacity in peak periods is one of the greatest challenges our ferry services face, uh, particularly given the, the wel very welcome increase in visitors we have to uh, the Western Isles, and recognise that service reliability and fleet resilience are also issues of high importance to island communities. So I, uh, in recognising that, I would also add, we've, we have added additional sailings to Loch Boysdale, uh, and uh, the Tarbert and the Loch Maddy service is a new route between Malig and Loch Boysdale, as I say, and significantly larger vessel on the service to Barrow. So this government is investing in service for the West Isles, but I'd be more than happy to meet Dr Allen and his constituents. Donald Cameron. Thank you. Um, in relation to the cost of the two new CalMac ferries that the Minister mentioned, which are now delayed, can he confirm whether there will be additional costs as a result of the delay, and if so, how much? <coughs> Minister. Well, I recognise that these are uh, matters I heard Jim McCall recently, uh, obviously uh, from Ferguson Marine, uh, discussing the difficulties in terms of getting regulatory approval. That is one of the, uh, the, the causes of, of delay in vessels being delivered. But I, I would hope the Chamber would be behind uh, the procurement of these uh, innovative new ferries from a Scottish engineering company. And I would be happy to engage with uh, Mr Cameron on further details of the, the procurement process and get him the details he requires. 